I owned the boat for a few years, and uh, it'll be neat to, to work with this group to, uh, to uh, kind of relive that experience uh, with being on the water. Uh, the issue is about the, the permitting. In, in general, the uh, Coast Guard and Corps of Engineers share responsibility of, uh, for these type of things, but there's uh, plenty. It's pretty easy to put out a uh, buoy. And uh, as long as it's properly marked and not in a in a channel, not not if it's in a navigation area, that's a big deal. If it's in a log, it's a big deal. So uh, turn it over here to uh, Hard Luck Industries. I'd like to thank all of the uh, uh, students so far have been doing a remarkable job of uh, staying on time. Also like to uh, again thank Brian Wilson for his consulting on this project uh, on a previous project. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming and welcome to Hardlock Industries Presents Lab Walk. Cheers to Hardlock Industries team. I'm Mike Ketty, the project manager. I'm Nora Borsera, the software engineer and technical writer. I'm Chad Murray, the design and software engineer. I'm Ricky Sock, the design engineer. I'm Michael Cervich, the electronics engineer. So here are a couple of things that we're going to go over today about our device. We're going to start with the motivation on why, why we're choosing this device for our labs, the requirements for it. Magnetic, the magnetic stripe reader, which is going to be the main focal point, the overview system description, a risk analysis, standards, a timeline, and our test plan. Now, followed by Nora, going to talk about motivation. So for our motivation, we had to do some research into what the likelihood is of different labs being infiltrated in different universities across the U.S. Now, one particular case was in 2012, Baldwin Wallace University. Four students broke into the lab and they stole various chemicals to make and sell ecstasy on their campus. The students then got arrested and thrusted Baldwin Walls University into the negative spotlight. Now, Manhattan College as well as other universities do not want this. And we can see on a daily basis in our own Leo Engineering building, people are constantly going out of labs. We don't know if they're qualified, if they're unqualified, we have no clue. Now, the purpose of our system is to keep the labs secure and also to track is going in and out of labs at different times, so hopefully we will see that as we follow up through this lab. Um, I'm going to to Jack for the requirements of the system. All right, so you can see this requirements that we do for our project. We start off with Wi-Fi transmission to avoid uh, running Ethernet cables to our infrastructure, uh, and also Wi-Fi is readily accessible all throughout this all throughout this building in Leo as well, even in Lab 216. Our rapid response time of two seconds, we just chose arbitrarily, which will determine the specifications of our other various components, including Sisters, transistors, capacitors, etc. Our power source, we will be wiring our uh, system in the light so that we can uh, provide power for our system. And we'll most likely be using some sort of a step down transformer to bring the uh, voltage down to 122 or something more suitable for our system. Uh, we have a printed circuit board that we're going to implement to avoid uh, spacing issues in the wall as well as uh, loose wires and safety issues that, uh, that come with implementing the breadboard into the wall. And then we have our magnetic strike reader, which I'll let Michael search. There are multiple ways in which we considered a student or faculty member to identify themselves to our system. Could have been a PIN number, could have been the RFID chip within our student ID, or it could have been the magnetic strike on our ID. Three factors that really went into this decision were the ease of use, the ease of implementation, <coughs> and then the cost. Through decision matrix and pros and cons lists, we were able to land on the magnetic strike reader. The one we would prefer to use the RFID, <coughs> the chip within our ID card is made by this specific company, and you would then have to use, may have to use their software in order to run it. We did want to avoid that cost for that software so we can make our own software. There are three tracks on the magnetic stripe that could contain information. The Manhattan College ID has information on track two. That information is simply a 16-digit number that is printed on the front of our ID. Ricky will now talk more. With our system, it provides us with much needed security for our labs. It is designed to give access to authorized users as well as deny access for unauthorized users. Our system contains a microcontroller that acts as the brain and operations of our system. The microcontroller will transmit data to and from all the other um, devices in our system. It can also access our online database by transmitting data over Wi-Fi. Our main component of our system is 
the solenoid. A microcontroller can drive our solenoid in order for us to unlock the door and allow users to enter. I will now give up to Mike to go into detail about just some description. Alright, so here's a high level block diagram of our design. Red arrows indicate the incoming data and blue arrows indicate outgoing data from our microcontroller. I already spoke about the magnetic strength reader. That will just simply be used for identification. That will feed data into the microcontroller. The microcontroller will handle two basic tasks communication to our software database and initializing the solenoid circuit. We will use that Wi-Fi transmi uh, Wi-Fi transmitter to communicate. There are two main security risks, man-in-the-middle attacks and IP spoofing. Those can be um, forego by um, encryption and decryption and making sure that um, communication channel is secure. Our software database will be described late in later slides, but that will house the information of who is truly allowed into the lab. Our solenoid is the main component. That will be in charge of locking or unlocking the door. The sol we needed to think of a time, which Jack <coughs> said as two seconds for the rapid response to actually unlock the door. Using that, we will calculate net forces needed to actually pull the solenoid in using Newton's law of motion, and since it will be a spring-loaded solenoid, there will also be Hooke's law involved. That, using Hooke's law, we can calculate energy and work needed, and then that will size our solenoid. Once we have a size solenoid, that solenoid will then pass specific specifications, and we can begin to look into the electronic components that need to go into the circuit, diodes, transistors, resistors, capacitors, to make sure nothing is receiving too much current and there can be no going out. There will also be a mechanical override. There can be power failures, there can be Wi-Fi outages, and there can be emergencies that need, where people do not have access to the lab. So therefore, a simple key, we plan on consulting with a mechanical engineer for that lever system that will override the solenoid, and plan to make use of the 3D printer here on campus. Ricky will now go into the software. An activity guide was created to visually show how our system works internally. I just want to start off by scanning the user ID. Once the ID is scanned, the magnetic shock meter would then send information out to our microcontroller. From there, the microcontroller would then fetch data from our user database using Wi-Fi. Once the two pieces of information are brought to the microcontroller, it would then compare the two pieces of information. Then the microcontroller would hit a decision-making node. If the two pieces of information match, the microcontroller will understand that the user is valid to enter the lab. However, if the two pieces of information does not match, the microcontroller will understand the user is invalid. In both cases, the microcontroller will write to our timestamp database a specific time, date, and a 16-digit number pertaining to each user. In the case of the user is valid, a green LED will appear on the magnetic strike reader, indicating that the user is able to enter the lab, and therefore the door will unlock. The user will enter the lab, and the door will again lock. In the other case where the user is invalid, a red LED will appear in the magnetic truck reader and came to the user that does not have access to the lab. I will now hand it off to Nora to talk more about maintaining our database. Okay, so our database is where all our information is going to be stored for the system, and certain administration and faculty will be the ones inputting this data since they're students that will be tracking. Now, as uh, <coughs> administration and faculty will be granted permissions by us to crud, create, read, update, and delete information because students will be graduating certain years and the students will be coming in, so the information is constantly changing, so we need to keep it up to date as possible. Our entire database will be stored on our server where it can be accessed at any time the administration sees fit. And also, whenever someone swipes an ID, there will be a timestamp next to each of their names, so if the equipment in the lab has been damaged or something has been stolen, we're able to narrow down who has been in the lab at what times and So going over this high-level design to risk, when we were testing our small uh, circuit for the solenoid, we came across the execution. Now, it's different depending on the solenoid, it can run from uh, you know half an amp up to two amps, so it can be very, very lethal to a human. So to, to prevent this, like Jack, like Jack said, we were going to implement PCB and the circuit board to so make sure there's no outstanding wires, so someone can go and touch it, and it, so that person would not get electrocuted. For power outages, that happens frequently in New York City. Blackout like in 2000, I think it was one, 2001. And um, so, if the power was out, 
the lock, the, the lock system will shut off, like any other electrical component. So, it, like Mike said, we're going to implement a mechanical lock that would have a lever connected to the solenoid. So all, all its um, faculty member just needs a key, turns the door, opens the lever, pushes the solenoid back, and the, the door will open. From a maintenance point of view, we're going to house the whole PCB and the specifications in the inside part of the lab, at which would be under lock and key in a, in a housing mechanism. So if something fails on the future, like you know, capacitor bust or something like that, um, it's very easy. A technician can come, go in there, do it, do what he has to do. We mount it off the wall, take it, fix it, and so forth. From an adoption point of view, in the future we're looking not just for Manhattan College, but we're looking for other schools. And we know that other schools have different types of student IDs and what they have on those student ID numbers. So they, they need to be willing to work with us because we're going to need that information. When we, uh, when we propose our system, we need to ask for that information in order to modify our database. So our database will be different per a different school because based on the information that they're going to be getting to us. Uh, as from a technological risk, we know that there are some out there, a lot of systems out there already. So but the difference between ours and theirs is that we're actually going to do it over Wi-Fi because a lot of them have Ethernet ports that go from every lock. And the fact that we have, um, it will be the inside part of, of, the, of, the, of the, um, the door. So all the person needs to do is come and swipe on the magnetic strip on the outside because that's all you can see. So now I will pass on to Jack to talk about standards. So you can see here a list of standards that are associated with our project. Uh, starting off with our electronic standards, we have EVL 294, which uh, describes the construction and operation and design of an access control system, which is exactly what we're creating here at Harlock Industries. We have Motorola SPI and Blip Size Squared C, which are both not real standards, they're de facto standards that have been accepted by uh, the industry to be very viable. Uh, SPI uses a single master and multi slave protocol, whereas Blip Size Squared C uses multi master and multiple slave, so it's packed communication. Probably going with the SPI protocol uh, due to the fact that it allows for a higher capability for uh, uh, better capability for higher throughput speeds and transfer of data, which is very important for our system. Uh, uh, wi Fi, we have IEEE 802.11n, which operates on 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz bands that are available uh, at Manhattan College via JetMed uh, service. Uh, for our building safety code, we uh, have NEC 2014. Um, describes electrical wiring and electrical equipment and installation standards and practices. For the magnetic strike card, we have ISO 7810, which describes the physical properties of magnetic strike cards, and NIST SP 800 96 for the interoperability between the card and the reader to ensure that they work together. And for our encryption, we have NIST FIPS 197, which introduced advanced encryption <coughs> in 2001, which is uh, basically algorithms and magnetic. Formulas that um, allow us to protect our equipment. Now, I'll talk about the timeline. Uh, just a very simple overview. We have our PCB design, lock mechanism design, database and server development all happening at the same time between January and February for our critical design review. And then during that and after, we will have our back end and maintenance development, which we hope to end in April, along with our system uh, testing for our final product in May 2016. And now, we'll allow service to explain our future test plans. Because each component is separate, you can build each, each component and start to develop each component separately. So the, soft, the software database can be built. The mechanical locking mechanism can be built. The electronics can be designed. Once those are all designed, you can test each one individually, make sure that they are working properly. Then you will in implement them all together, and you can test it as a whole, make sure no other bugs come up during Brian, so it's a lock up this system. <laughs> uh, pretty, pretty much, our lab lock will secure all labs and make sure people who are allowed to go in are allowed to go in. Who aren't, who aren't, um, they won't be able to take like they, everyone has said before. They won't be able to take any equipment or break any equipment. From from our test solenoid, for pre preliminary results, it does work, and we're just gonna talk about how we're going to make it to a, an actual door solenoid that will fit a door. So it, it's going to, the voltages, the trend, all the stuff that we use for our test one is going to change due to the complexity of the solenoid. And to drive that to standards, as Jack mentioned, we'll go with the IEEE, the Wi-Fi, and the solenoid standards. 
So to sum it all up, we would need funding for parts ordered in January, and that concludes the presentation. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, let us know.
switch and would also have to step down transformer to go to supply the voltage that we 